Our second scripture reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, 5 through 8, and 15 through 16. I suggest follow along on the screen, or you can try and go through the Bible and just skip verses. So, whichever you'd like to do. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you also in the body are also in the body. Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never fail you, nor forsake you. Hence, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their life, and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For those of you who were with us last week, it was a really difficult text and topic. Um, and it was just the chapter before this in Hebrews that was describing God as an all-consuming fire. Um, and it was a text that called us um, to accountability, to remember that God is transcendent, that God is other from us, that God is more than us, that God is beyond us, and that part of what it means to follow this God means that we are following a God who is against sin. And so insofar as we are a part of sin, then this God is against us. And like an all-consuming fire, will consume those parts of us. Now, the hope in this is that in looking at, you know, rare, rare metal, metals um, that are refined in fire, that this is a fire that sets us free to be our true and our full selves. Um, but getting burnt and getting refined is not a pleasant process. Um, and it's not a warm process fuzzy concept of God and thinking about God as completely other. So we did our due diligence last week and confronted these texts and dealt with them and took them on. And as I sat down last Monday to get the sermon prepped for this Sunday, I was like, okay. And then I read today's text. <laughs> and we are not let off the hook yet. Um, we might have a more imminent God presented to us as a parent and wanting Israel to listen and the exhortations that Hebrews gives us for how we are to exactly lead holy lives and follow God. Um, but this call to right relationship and right living is still just as much um, a prominent theme today as it was last week. Dang it. Um, so here we come, and I couldn't help but think, and Leslie, if you're listening, this is Steve's fault because he told me I could say this. Um, Leslie came um, after service uh, last week and was talking about, she's like, that was a really hard one um, and pretty uncomfortable. But I guess if you think of God as a parent, you know, then God does know what's right, and if it's not right, it's not right. Um, and so you have those dad moments of being like, mm -mm, not right, not okay. The mom moments of, that's not the way I raised you. Or, you know, the worst moments, we're so disappointed in you. I hate those ones. This is that parent coming through in these texts today. It's so hard um, and, and we have the full spectrum of parenthood in this psalm, 
um, that comes from our, our um, lectionary reading today. And we have God remembering the time his kids were in trouble and how God as mother came and rescued them and took care of them and got them um, to a safe place where they would be okay and not under Pharaoh and not enslaved anymore. But in this safety, now there is a problem and that the Israelites, the kids aren't listening anymore. And so there's all this stuff happening that could be avoided. And there's all of this finest wheat and honey that God could be providing if the kids would just listen and get there. That doesn't resonate at here at all, right? Like that's one of the worst experiences, right? Like watching a child encounter a harm or go through something that's painful that you know didn't have to happen they would have just listened, you could have saved them that. And kids, if you're getting a little uneasy right now, um, this happened for us and our parents and happens for all of us in our relationship with God. So we're all right here together with you. So we come to this psalm and we come to this passage from Hebrews where God is asking that we listen where God is asking that we give all of who we are so God can do some pretty amazing things. And there's a Hebrew Bible professor from Claremont that puts an even different spin on this psalm um, that goes with how we translate the Hebrew. So Barry, if you would bring those slides up. We're looking at verses 13 through 14, 15. And now it starts pretty similar. So I have the New Revised Standard Version up top and then John Berquist's translation on the bottom. So, oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. And I wish that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my path. So pretty similar. But here's where it starts to change, Barry. Um, then I would quickly subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. So the NRSV has a pretty militant God who's ready to wipe out the enemies. And John um, suggests a different translation. Um, this is God speaking. Quickly I would make their enemies humble and I would reach out my hand to their opponents. Very. And continuing in John's translation, those who hated Yahweh would change themselves towards God and God would be with them forever. And the NRSV is differing and still the militancy. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him and their doom would last forever. So those are two pretty different translations, right? Um, and here's what John has to say about um, why he did this translation. This suggested translation is not certain, but the difference between this translation and the NRSV highlights some ambiguities involved in any translation of these verses. It is not clear that God is standing ready to punish and destroy. Instead, God may desire that Israel change its ways into more godly paths so that they no longer antagonize others. What? We might be antagonizing others? No, definitely not here at Epworth anyways. Further, God may be promising that if the people act rightly, God could quickly get the enemies of Israel and the haters of God to change their minds and their actions when God extends a saving hand to them as well. Israel and its enemies could then live together forever with God. In either translation, the psalm points to a time of unity with God's presence, and this miracle of salvation begins with the Israelites' return to God and their practice of God's principles in their lives. I like this translation suggestion because it resonates so much with me. Because fessing up is hard, awkward work. And I know that even if I'm ready to take acknowledge and acknowledge what I've done wrong, I'm still going to have that propensity to downplay it and to rework at least the hardest, roughest edges, to slide it in just a little bit easier and swallow it just a little bit more smoothly. But to the credit of our brothers and sisters way back in these ancient psalms, the verses that are not included in the lectionary reading say that this was a psalm that was sung 
and that was remembered um, regularly in worship with every full moon and every new moon. And so this remembrance of what God has done and a confession of where the Israelites have failed to listen are regularly woven in to their worship life together. And what that means is that it keeps a tense and an awkward conversation happening. What that means is that what I so wanted last week to deal with the uncomfortable and then get the gold star for having done that and then get to move on and, and get to the better warm fuzzy parts means that that doesn't happen, that we keep the discomfort in us so that we keep our need to grow before us and that we don't check it off a list but that we see it as a continual process, as a continual growing and as a continual refining and as a continual possibility. Because what I like from this translation from this professor is that even the possibility of the good outcome is beyond our imagination. So even when we are in this um, process of confessing with each other and holding each other accountable to our growth, what we see as the great end is that our enemies will be subdued. What God sees as the great end is that those enemies aren't even enemies anymore. Is that where there was division, all of a sudden there's a new orchestration. So that what once was opposed, you know, those horrible notes of discordance that just keep you lingering and hanging there are resolved. And that there's a depth and a nuance to the harmony and to the rhythms that weren't there before. Honey from the rock. There is finest wheat and there is honey in the rock for all God's children. Now, do we go to rocks for honey? No. But do we have a God who is able to bring that forth? Yes. And that's exactly what this author of Hebrews is calling us to, to see beyond even our greatest goals, to entertain strangers, not from we're going to run out of food and it's going to take this time, but from the synergies and the openings that can happen that we never knew or we never saw possible. Let mutual love continue. The RSV translation has brotherly love, but sisters were not off the hook on this one. <laughs> it's both and. Let mutual love continue. And so we have this whole list of ways that we can grow and help one another ease ourselves in to the more that we can discover in honey from the rock. And almost all of that revolves around empathy of putting ourselves in each other's shoes. The call from Hebrews was for those who are in prison, for those who are tortured. For whatever we are going through, whether it is the 36 homeless kids at Padonia, whether it is the refugees that are displaced and don't have a home, whether it is those who have lost loved ones suddenly and traumatically, our call is to empathy, to look not only to our good, but more to the good of others. And as we've been working this week at Epworth trying to figure out Sunday school, it's been a tricky year. There's been a lot to figure out because we've got confirmation happening with our seventh graders, which is awesome. But then that kind of leaves our sixth graders in this limbo world between elementary school and joining youth group. And, and then that trickles all the way down to our pre-K and our kindergarten and how do we best group our kids so that we can best share our faith. And as we were having these conversations, I got to experience your all priority of mutual love. So I'm gonna call her out and one of these conversations with, with Christina, and I'm not gonna get the wording exactly right, but we were talking and she was really worried about making sure that Kara would be challenged enough and would be 
have enough opportunities to grow because Kara, you're growing up, right? You're ready to take more on. Yeah, you got it, girl. Um, and so, but the grouping was such that that wasn't going to work this time around. And so as I was talking with Christina, she's like, look, I'm not going to make a fuss and make this all about me and Kara, but I do want her to grow. And I also want what's going to work for the church and for all of the kids. You guys, that's a huge gift. That is the exact, exact philosophy and exact orientation that we're called to have together as we work this way together. And because of Christina's openness to processing and figuring out a way that would both work for the church and for Kara, we're working with Debbie and with Catherine, who will be leading that class to figure out another adult and helper to get in there so that there is some focus time for Kara and for anyone else who's rather ready to take another couple steps in their walk. And for Joelle and Bryant on the sixth grade end, they have stepped forward and said that they would be a part of helping so that they can take what they have learned and grown in through their elementary school years and help those who are still in it and working through. And there's a lot to learn, teachers, right? You do a lot of learning while you're teaching. And Joel, that means that youth ministry is especially important right now so that you keep getting your own learning too. And who are our confirmands? Seventh graders, raise your hands. Yep, yep. Okay, so I want you to hear how much organizing is going on in this church family so that you can intentionally focus on this confirmation process. This is pressure. All right, and this is pressure because this is a big deal, and we want for you all to have an empowered way to explore your faith and understand and figure out a way that you take your next steps. And we're going to back you in that, but you better take it seriously because you got all these people reorganizing their lives so you can. Got it? All right, I want to see some nods, Suje. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, all right, good. This is what it means to be in this together. This is what it means to listen together, and this is what it means to walk together as a church. So thank you. Thank you, family. I want to close with a quote from George Herbert. Because as we move forward, we are not neglecting to do good and sharing what we have, as has been evidenced this week. And there is no greater sign of holiness than procuring and rejoicing in another's good. So Epra family, for all that has already been procured, for all that has already been organized for our kids and for our youth, I give thanks. And for all that will be organized so that we can all be amazed by the honey that comes from the rock, let's do this journey together. Amen. <laughs>